Hello everybody, how's it going? Ben Gothard here, and uh, today we are joined by Betsy Irvine. How you doing today, Betsy? Good! How's everybody? Great, great, great. So, you know, today Betsy has graciously agreed to come and do this live workshop where we are going to give you the beginner's guide to SEO. We're going to be breaking down so many different things. We're going to be talking about mobile friendly. We're going to be talking about meta tags. We're going to be talking about different backlinks. And we're basically going to be giving you the tools and knowledge that you need in order to dominate SEO from here on out. Uh, but, but first, um, I want to really introduce Betsy because Betsy and I have been friends for a while, uh, probably close to two years now. Um, and Betsy is, is the best graphic designer and web developer that I know. Um, and I'm very grateful for you, Betsy, for coming on to this workshop and sharing the knowledge that you've accrued. So uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about yourself and your story and, and how you got to where you are now. All right. Okay. So I'm Betsy. Um, I was, uh, first of all, I am not an expert on anything. Everything that I've learned has been self-taught, digging down, but I feel like I'm finally getting somewhere with um, the top of, topic of SEO. Um, I started as a graphic designer um, in about 1993 and started my own company in 94. The internet wasn't really that popular yet. Um, I was doing mostly print work. Um, I built my first website in 2000 and <laughs> it was pretty basic. <laughs> but um, fast forward maybe 10 years, worked at some interactive ad agencies, uh, two of the top interactive agencies were IMC Squared in Dallas and then Atmosphere BBDO out of New York City. Um, kind of tinkered with my own company versus working for other people for a long time and um, I don't think I'm, <laughs> I'm never going back. Um, it's just going to be me from now on. Uh, so my first company was called B Graphic, B for Betsy, get the double meeting. And I also have a brand out of Baton, that's out of Dallas. I have a brand out of Baton Rouge called Yowza Design, which I started five years ago when I moved to Baton Rouge. So I kind of keep them all separate. And um, I've been doing websites for a while now. I did have about a brief five-year period where I was doing flash animation, but obviously that's dead now. So here I am back to traditional web design. Um, I could not find anyone to send SEO work to, and for those of you that don't know what that is, it's what everybody is asking me for forever. Search engine optimization, they're like, how can I get my website at the top of the page, um, at the search engine results page? And I, you know, I tried different companies and I just couldn't find anybody that I recommended. Some of my clients did extensive research and paid thousands and thousands of dollars and still came back with, can't really find anybody that knows what they're doing. So I just buckled down and started watching YouTube videos, reading articles, and now I feel like I kind of know what I'm doing, but it seems like the more that I read, the more I realize I don't know. So I'm, again, no expert, but... I have got my website up there to number four um, for local search results for uh, Baton Rouge web design, which is really tough considering who my competitors are. My competitors are doing the same tricks that I'm doing. So if I had some niche product, you know, like straw brooms, and I was the only company doing that, obviously it'd be fairly easy to get to the top. But when you have a product that is more popular and there are the that your competitors are savvy like you are, then it gets harder and harder and harder. So, um, for the topics for discussion for today, I'm going to talk about all the major things that, well, not all of them, but the major things that affect your placement on the search engines. And from this point forward, I'm going to refer to them as SERPs, Search Engines Results Page. Um, the number one thing, first and foremost, is, is, is your site mobile friendly? About a year ago, Google changed its algorithm and now what they are doing is indexing the mobile version of your site 
before the desktop version. So the mobile is actually more important than the desktop, but you need both. So if your site's not mobile friendly, you, there's no way you're at the top. This is the first thing to fix because in 2014, mobile internet usage overtook desktop usage. This means that there's more people on the internet on mobile devices than coming from computers. That was 2014. Wow. I don't even know what the percentage is now three years later, but I'm guessing it's improved since then. Google has so many free products that are available. If you're a DIYer and you want to just gather some data, it's very easy to do. I love Google. I love all their products that they have. So um, the first one I'm going to talk to you about is their mobile friendly test. Ben is going to give you all the links that I'm talking about at the end of this session, so uh, don't worry about writing anything down. So the Google Mobile Friendly Test, you just put in your website, and it will tell you a score for your PC and for your mobile version of your website, and it will also recommend things that you can do yourself to improve your score. Now, some of these things, if you don't have web skills like HTML or know how to FTP or things like that, you may have to get someone to help you. But there are some things that you can do yourself with no coding knowledge. Um, anyway, so that that uh, URL is search.google.com slash test slash mobile dash friendly. So um, another important tool with regard to mobile friendly is called responsinator.com. Now this site isn't 100% accurate. Um, I usually use this to see how a website looks on mobile devices because I have an Android phone, and sometimes the site looks completely different on an iPhone. So I don't have an iPhone to test on. So I will go to responsinator.com and see how it looks, and it will show you a preview of every size screen, tablet, phone, whatever. And it's, it's really nice. I usually also do it on my phone <laughs> as well because this is the most foolproof method. Um, and by the way, responsive is the term that is used to refer to sites that are mobile friendly because the screen size squishes down or expands depending on what size screen you have. So if you go to the site, there's a little code that'll sniff out your screen size and it'll serve up the appropriate version of the site for that screen size. And most of the sites are all pulling from the same data, but there may be several style sheets and several size images for each of the screen sizes. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay. Definitely. So okay. um, let's uh, let's move let's move on. We talked a little bit about mobile friendly uh, and I think we all know the importance of that seeing as, you know, most web traffic is going to be moving towards mobile uh, you know in, in the future. Um, but but let's talk a little bit about site security. Right, because yes. I because I know that there's a big uh, kind of a big push right now by Google to make sure your site's secure. So can you, can you talk a little bit about site security? Yes, and this is actually a new trend. So before Google would reward sites that had what's called a secure certificate, and uh, as of any day now, so Chrome. 62 is about to come out, and they keep saying mid-October, and this is October 14th, so I don't know exactly what day, but when it does, there's going to be a shift in that trend where they're going to start penalizing sites that don't have secure certificates. So this is very important. It was important before because you got a few points because you had the certificate, but now it's going to be a penalty if you collect any type of data. So first of all, SSL stands for Secure Socket Layer, I believe, and it's a certificate that you can either buy or get free, and you install it on your, your uh, website, on the server. So I know you've probably seen, when you go to a website, it'll say like HTTP. Well, when it's a secure site, it'll say HTTPS, and that S that stands for secure. Sometimes you'll see a lock down on the bottom, and that'll also tell you that. There's three types of certificates. Um, I'm not going to go into each thing very deeply, but there's three levels of security. If you're taking credit card information, you need that highest level. And you actually go through a lot of paperwork and prove about your organization. And and then your, dom your company name will be on the top with that HTTPS. 
not everybody needs that. But if you do take any kind of input at all, even a, just an email address, you need some sort of certificate so that you don't get penalized. But I really recommend, even if you're not taking information, go ahead and get the certificate because those points are worth something. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, can you talk a little bit about um, about malware and, and uh, Google Blacklist and, and those types of things? Yes. If you um, are taking credit card data and not with a secure certificate, Google is going to blacklist you as soon as that new Chrome comes out. So that's really, really bad. And what blacklisting means is there's different levels of it. But maybe you've gone to a website before and saw a big red warning that said, warning, this site is not secure or it has malware or whatever. And you have the choice, either proceed with safety or go, I mean, go away with safety or proceed in danger zone. So that's blacklisting. And it can happen where even in the search results, it'll say uh, not safe. So that's really, really, really bad. Um, the other way to get blacklisted is if you have malware on your site. Now, if you have just a regular website with just HTML files and no database of any kind, you probably don't need to worry about this. But if you have any kind of hole, meaning a door, like a database where a spider can get in, a hacker can get in, then you do need to worry about this. And the number one uh, is WordPress sites. And that's probably the most popular, which is why that's how they get in. And especially it has to do with like all the plugins and stuff. They can have holes. And anyway, if you have malware, Google will do the exact same thing and they will blacklist you. So if you want to know if your site has malware or is blacklisted, you can go to a site called Security and click on their scanner and they will tell you. If you have malware, you're going to probably have to get some help to get it removed. Uh, it can get really embedded in the code, and it can be really uh, hard to remove. But once you have it removed, you can go to Google's uh, blacklist removal request form and say, okay, and they'll ask you what steps you did, and you say, okay, I cleaned my files, whatever. And then they'll tell you yes or no, and then you wait like a day or two, and they'll tell you whether they're going to remove the restriction and put you back to normal. Wow. There's a lot of information here. So let's just recap a quick. So first, and, and I think you said most importantly, is the mobile friendly, right? we got to yes. make sure that it's responsive, it's mobile friendly, everything looks nice when it gets squished onto the phone or the tablet. Um, that's super important. Uh, the next is the security, right? And we don't want to get blacklisted, so we want to make sure that uh, we're going to get the correct certificates for the SSL, so we can instead of have, having HTTP, we can have HTTPS, um, and then we also want to make sure that we're definitely not blacklisted by Google because it's hard enough to get clicks and to get business. We don't want to have to overcome Google saying this is not a safe site. Okay, so these are kind of the things we've been talking about so far. Um, let's move a little bit more into. Um, into like keywords. Okay, can you talk about about keywords and the importance of that? Okay, another big factor is um, how well your site is optimized. Um, there's two types of uh, search engine optimization. There's just the general good practice, and then there's also local. So first, we can talk about the general. Um, it's important to have the right keywords on your website. So when I first started tinkering with this on my site. I noticed that I used the word design a lot. I had graphic design, print design, logo design, web design. So the word design was the most popular word on my page when really that's not the way it should be. So you got to look at your words and, and go to, there's a Google AdWords keyword suggestion tool. It's free to use. You log in with your Gmail ID and then you select, you go to Google AdWords, select tools, and then keyword planner. And then you search for new keywords, like say, say you're an electrician, okay? But you also do HVAC work. So it'll suggest all sorts of other words that maybe you didn't think of. And then you can plan the proper words. And there is like a certain amount of density and, and you can link the words. And there's a lot of things you can do once you have those words. And I'll get into that later if we have time. 
but basically you need to have the correct keywords also for local. Like, so if you really only work in, you know, a 10 mile area, put that zip code in there, put that area code in there, put that city name in there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, I want to touch a little bit more on the power of the, uh, Google keyword planner. Um, because that is a tool that I feel like is very heavily underutilized by people, but Google will literally tell you which keywords have which amount, uh, have what search volume, right? So, so they'll tell you, let's say the term graphic design has 500,000 searches per month, just an example. I don't know how many actually has per month, but it'll say, you know, this much per month. And then you can, like Bessie was saying, it'll suggest keywords that are related to the one that you input, right? So you can go, and let's say you're doing social media marketing, so let's say you're doing internet marketing, whatever you're doing, you can figure out all these really important keywords to put onto your site in order for Google to recognize you as a place where this sort of information is being is being held. Is that kind of the right um, kind of the right idea? Yes. And um, if if and when you do get to the point where you're setting up AdWords or something like that, Google will suggest words that are the exact opposite of what you want sometimes. Um, you, those are called negative keywords, so you don't want to spend money to pay for those keywords if it's not something you want. So just remember when you set it up to eliminate those words. So for instance, I'm not interested in getting hired to do um, teach people how to do web design. So I would want to exclude the words training, uh, webinar, seminar, obviously free, you know, those types of words I don't want. So we'll get those off the list with the negative keyword tool. Very cool. Very cool. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about, because I think it, it, it's a nice segue uh, into Google Trends and maybe give a little overview of that. That is another tool. There are so many of these tools. Um, that is another tool. Like it does basically what you just said. Well, kind of. It tells you how popular a keyword is. So let's just say um, I search for web design and I see there's, you know, a million or a million hits for web developer, but only 10,000 for web designer then maybe I might want to put that web developer word more often than web designer because I'm fishing from a bigger pond. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, just another thing on Google Trends, um, it, it gives you the, the popularity of a certain search term over time, right? And so it gives you the trend analysis of that certain keyword, right? So let's say you're in e-commerce, for example and you're looking for new products to sell, or you're trying to research a product that you already have, or your inventory, whatever it may be. Well, you can go and type in different keywords related to your products, and you can see the time of year that is the best to sell these products. You can see which products are worth you, worth you selling, right? Because well, let's say you're selling something related to uh, owls, just for example. Well, you can see whether or not people are more interested in owl necklaces versus owl rings, and at what time of the year. Because you might see a spike come Q4 because people are getting a lot of presents for holidays and whatnot. Um, so it would only be worth your time to start selling it a little bit later in the year, whereas in January it has no search volume. So Google Trends is a really, really powerful tool um, just to learn more about, about your keywords. Um, so let's, let's move on and talk a little bit about content. Um, can you talk about content writing and, and uh, give a little overview on that? Uh, well, Ben, you're probably more of an expert on content writing than I am. However, I'm going to talk about the SEO aspect of it. I kind of mentioned before that my content had the word design way too many times. So, when you're writing your content, you need to work those keywords into the content. And the sooner into the content, like more towards the beginning of the page, might be worth more points than toward the end of the page. But then there's some other things that you can do. Like if you have a link on the word, uh, let's just say owl ring, like you were talking about, you have a link on that word. You don't say click here to see our owl ring because then you're putting the link on click here, which means nothing. You need it on the owl ring, 
and it goes to a page called Owl Ring, and it's big and bold with some sort of H2 tag, then that is worth a lot more than just having those words on your page. So, But the whole thing has to sound natural. It can't sound weird, and it can't sound like you just crammed all those words in there. So it's a, it's a balance between relevant content and then th doing some of these little tricks. Absolutely. So can you talk a little bit about uh, rich snippets? I'm not exactly sure uh, what those are, and, and you know, I personally would like to learn more about those. Actually, I just read about these for the first time last, uh, last week. They mm -hmm. are new. Um, they're little tags that you can put on um, content that tell Google what it is. So, like, say you're promoting your ebook, Ben, you could put a little code in the back end on that that says author Ben Gothard. Subject equals uh, internet marketing or whatever you want, and then it tells Google what it is. Okay. So that's just another additional identifier for mm -hmm. Google. Yeah, and I've heard that this is helping with SEO. I have not played with it yet. as It's very, very new. But I'm going to. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about landing pages, but maybe you could, you could go a little bit more in depth with it um, and just talk about the importance of landing pages. Landing pages are very important. Um, so I have a landing page for every one of my services. Um, I can tell you, you need to have those keywords in the, the actual name of the file. So like my web design page is called web-design.html. That's pretty simple. Um, and then you need to have a big title on that page that says web design with a tag, like an H2 tag. Um, also, it's important not to use underscores in your links. Always use the dash. Um, okay, so let's keep going. Uh, let's talk about sitemaps and what those are. Yeah, go to the link that I have that'll be at the end, but it'll create an XML file and an HTML file. So you'll have the option to do both. I usually do both. I mean, I don't understand why some want XML and some want HTML, but when you do some of these tools that score your site, some of them score give you points for having an XML and some of them give you points for having an HTML. So you might just want to do both. Very cool, very cool. Um, and let's talk about broken links next. This is actually pretty important and um, there is a tool that you can go to that will tell you any links that are broken. If you have these broken links, not only is it costing you points for SEO, it's annoying to your uh, prospective client and it makes you kind of look bad. So it's a really good idea to check all the broken links and fix them and then you'll get more points for that. Absolutely. And, and you know, just to clarify a little bit, uh, a broken link is, you know, if somebody searches for either your business or, or a certain keyword that you're ranked for on Google and they click it and then there's like an error when you pop up, right? That, well, that would be for link. the root domain. That's a problem with the site, but actually it would be like a missing image would be a broken link. Mm -hmm. So say you made this page and you had this logo there and then later on you're cleaning out your images folder and you're like, oh, I don't need that anymore and you delete it. Well, that image disappears and that's a broken link or you delete a page that used to be there, or, you know, this happens a lot. You link to somebody else's site, and they remove that page, and now your link doesn't work anymore. Ah, okay. So that's definitely a really good thing to check for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and now let's talk a little bit about server speed and how important that is. Yeah, this is something that a lot of people don't even think about. I mean, most of these things that I talk about are to speed up your site. And they will speed up your site. And the faster your site is, the more pleasing it is for the user. And also, Google will give you points. But if you make the fastest site in the world and you got this crappy server, it's slowing you down. So you need to test and see what kind of server you have. If it's really slow, then either change companies or upgrade to the next level and then retest. Um, you want to get an 85 or higher um, to pass, to, to make it worthwhile. So bitcatcher.com is the place where you can test it. Mm -hmm. And then 85 or higher is what you want for your server speed. Okay. And so are there any, um, like preferred servers that you would recommend people to use or any to stay away from, or are they all kind of equal? 
that's hard to say because I've seen some people that like network solutions and they're paying thirty, forty dollars a month and it's bad. But I've also seen people at that same company that have no problems. I've seen um, now GoDaddy has their free servers, which are fine that you get like free with a, a domain name or whatever. And they're fine as long as you don't put much on there and not very many users go on there. So it matters the server itself and also how much traffic you have and how big your files are. So the best thing to do is just test and then either switch companies or go up one level. I had to upgrade mine a while back, but then again, I have like 30 sites on there. So, okay. Uh, that's good to know. That's good to know. Um, so now let's talk about ensuring that your CMS is equipped. So can you talk about what a CMS is and, and whatnot? CMS stands for Content Management System. The most popular is WordPress, but any site that basically lets you make changes yourself, that's a content management system. This is the thing that has the wormhole that I was telling you about, but if you want to make changes to your site yourself, it's totally worth it because you will save so much money and not have to hire a web designer every time you want to change your staff page. But if it is, now WordPress is so popular because as so many people are using it and they have so many toys, okay? These toys are both a blessing and a curse. So you may have a plugin that's for a free calendar or for MailChimp or for whatever, but that plugin comes with risk because if it is, does not have a lot of sales or good ratings, it could be uh, open you up to malware attacks. So it's a good idea that if you do install a plugin, make sure that it has a lot of downloads and, and a very good rating. Now, one that I do recommend for WordPress is called Yoast, Y-O-A-S-T, and that is an SEO plugin. Even if you don't know what you're doing, you can install that plugin and, and follow, follow all the questions and stuff and actually do some real help to your website. Wow, uh, that's cool. Um, okay, so now let's talk about Google's PageSpeed Insights tool. This thing is awesome. It will tell you your speed for the mobile version of your site and the desktop version of your site. So mm -hmm. speed is a very um, critical factor with determining your score. So you go to the site, you type in what your U URL is, and then it'll give you a score from zero to 100. You wanna try and get up above 80, but what it's gonna do, it's gonna tell you a lot of things that you can do that'll um, improve your score. So they have three categories, mm -hmm. good, needs work, and poor. And this is really interesting because I got my score uh, last week, and at first it was um, 72. And so I did as many things on the list as I could, maybe about 70% of them, and my score jumped to 83, which is good. So, and then just to see what other people's score was, I put Apple in there, and their score was like 50. So I don't know what... Maybe Google doesn't like Apple, but um, anyway, you can play with it, and you can also look at your competitor sites. You can put any site you want to in there. Very cool. That's very, very helpful. Okay, so now let's move on to W3C, validate your HTML and CSS. Okay, now we're getting really into some technical stuff here. Uh, W3C is the World Wide Web Consortium. And they basically have set standards of what is good coding and what is not good practice. So you can do a whole nother test on their site, but this tool has a reputation of being fairly harsh. So take everything that they say with a grain of salt. Um, I didn't get a very good score on my site, but I went ahead and did a few things that they said that were fairly easy to do. And my score did improve. Um, the jury is, not in yet whether this has any impact on SEO or not. So I would save this site for last and mm -hmm. do these other things, which I know for sure have an impact, but it's still interesting to see. Okay. And what sort of, what sort of, uh, I guess, constructive criticism did they offer to help improve your score? If you're using an older code, uh, uh, then they will give you penalties. So like if your site was created five or 10 years ago, you're probably going to get a bad score. Mm -hmm. um, my site was created probably 15 years ago, but I've gone through several uh, upgrades and redesigns and everything since then. 
but there's probably still some snippets of that old stuff in there. So you just never know. Um, you need to be using the newest, latest standard code for HTML and CSS. Okay, very cool, very cool. So now let's let's jump to local SEO, okay? Um, and let's, okay. let's look, yeah. This is if you have a company that's like a local reach. This is very very important. So you may be a national company. This really doesn't matter for you. But if you're like a plumbing company or an insurance company, and everybody is in like a geographical area for you, this is very very important. So. The first thing you need to do is do an analysis of your competitors. So I know who my competitors are. I put them in this little tool and it showed me what, you know, you can compare your site versus their site scores, the keywords, the backlinks, everything that they're doing. If they're high on the search engines ahead of you, then you need to figure out what they're doing and basically copy it. Very cool. So, One of the, uh, okay, so after you do the general SEO that we talked about before, you mm -hmm. want to go back and add these local things. Like, instead of, make sure you have your city name and your zip code and phone number because people search that way. They, um, mm -hmm. they might not just put nail salon, they might put nail salon New Orleans. They might put in a specific neighborhood even, like, you know, downtown or uptown or whatever. So make sure you have these words in there because if they're not, you're not going to come up. Right. So, um, another thing too, uh, there's a website called moz.com, M-O-Z. It's not free. It's actually expensive, but they have a free two week that they will let you do. Dig in there and get as many things done as you can while you have the access. But one of the things that they look at really deep is local SEO and another thing is called NAP like, a, like you dig an app <laughs> but it stands for name address phone so let's say your address on Yelp says Boulevard spelled out but on Yahoo it's BLVD that is confusing to the search engines and some will see it as two different businesses and split the results between those two so you want to go and verify every single one and make sure that it's consistent and they have a tool that will do that and but you do have to like say your Yelp page was created a long time ago and the girl's not there anymore and you don't know the password you're gonna have to figure all those passwords out um, so it's not that easy sometimes um, another thing to do is claim your local listings so I can't tell you how many clients have never verified their Google Maps listing it is so easy to do and they've never done it and you get so many points there are people that search on Google and never even look at the real results. They only see the map and thinks that's the results. So if you're not on there, that's really, really dumb when it, it literally takes five minutes. What happens is you'll go in and you'll say, verify my, my map listing. Google will mail you a postcard with a code on it. Then you have to go back to Google and say, here's my code. And then boom, you're done. That's super easy. That is yep. super, super, super easy. easy. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about backlinks. Okay, so we're now talking about inbound traffic to your site, which is another whole nother can of worms. A backlink is when somebody links to you. So if you have a Facebook page, make sure you put your website in the about section. Then you've got this huge trusted site called Facebook linking to you, which lends credibility to you. So that's a really good backlink. Mm -hmm. um, another thing, you, I mean, obviously go and do the uh, the obvious ones like Google and Yelp and places like that. But go and do a report on your competitors. I have found sites that I didn't even know about that they're on their directory. Like there was some web design directories or whatever, Yellow Page stuff. I mean, I thought Yellow Pages was dead, but it's not apparently. So there's a tool called Open Site Explorer. What you can do is put your URL in there and it will tell you every site that's linking to your site. Then go and put your competitors URL, only if your competitor's high on the search engines, and look and see what backlinks they have. Then just go to those backlinks and those websites and say, I want a free listing. Okay, let me verify my email address. Okay, done. I just got a really nice backlink. And with backlinks, the bigger that site is, 
and the more trusted it is, the more points it's worth. So you don't want just some stupid links. You want links that really count. Very cool. Very cool. And so to, to get a little creative with that, um, would that be a good time to maybe reach out to some of, you know, some, some partners and, and say, hey, you know, I'll put a link to your site on my site if you do the same. You know, is that is that helpful? Uh, there's a, some some rumors that if you each have a link to each other, they kind of cancel each other out. So I would first ask if they would put a link to me. If they want a reciprocal link, then put the link that you're linking on at a different page at least. That might yeah. help that. But let's just say you're a, a you know, you sell China. And one of your major distributors does not sell to the public. Why not? Why are you not on their find a location page? Mm -hmm. So go to your your vendor and say, hey, I'm selling your product. Please put me on your find a vendor page. That's a great link. And right. it's relevant. All right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. So now let's talk a little bit about reviews and how important they are. Reviews are very important for several reasons. And this is something that any Joe Blow can do. Um, first of all, they really do help you on the search engines um, because you've got sites like Yelp, Samato, uh, Yahoo, whatever, and they're saying, oh, this restaurant is awesome. In fact, I did this last night. We just picked a restaurant at random, and I went, what is the highest ranking rank website within 10 miles of me? And we went there, and it was awesome. So uh, anyway, the best organic listings are taken with the restaurants that have the, the best reviews. Now this works for any type of business, not just restaurants. So I have right now, I have 14 reviews on Google from my company. I took a look at it this morning. The next person above me has 22 and the one below me has five. So I need to work on getting some more reviews and get ahead of that guy that has 22. And so I reached out to a few of my clients and I said, would you please? And I sent them the link. Here's how you do it, and um, hopefully I'll be up at 23 next week. And, and that's that's so easy to do. Yes. It's so, so easy to do, especially if you're taking care of your customers. They're going to be more than happy to, to help take care of you as well. Now, a bad review is going to do you more damage than anything because whether you're on the search engines or not, if they go search for you and people are talking smack about you, they're not going to they're not going to go with your product. So... One thing you can do is if that's called this is called reputation management. If you have a bad review, the first thing you can do is try to reach out to the person that left you through the review and see if you can resolve the situation and then see if they'll remove it. Mm -hmm. In any case, putting a comment down there that says something very humble like I am so sorry and no excuses, we will do whatever, you know, at least whoever's seeing that review can see that you cared and you're acknowledging fault. Another good thing to do is shove it down on the list. So you have 10 good clients, they all leave you five star review. That little one star review is shoved way down. Odds are the average user isn't gonna scroll down that far. But if you are getting reviews, it's a good idea not to bunch them all up in the same week because it looks like you're trying to cram reviews. You really need to take the time and stretch them out. Right, right. Okay, let's talk about social media um, and, and how that impacts SEO. <clears throat> Social media is very important, as you well know, Ben, but there's some dispute as to whether it helps you on the search engines because Google says it doesn't use it. However, the sites that have a lot of social media traffic also are high on the search engines. So I'm thinking that it's not a cause, like the social media causes the sites to go up on Google, but there's some sort of collaboration there. So it's a really good idea to, ha and, and not to mention the backlink that I talked about earlier. <clears throat> um, so even if social media isn't a direct Google ranking factor, it is one of the best ways to promote content and be found online. So that is ultimately what, what, ultimately what SEO is all about. You can get a new audience, you can reach people that you wouldn't have reached otherwise, and get brand awareness. So I definitely think people should do it. It's free, it costs nothing, and it's really easy to do. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now let's move into pay-per-click. Talk about that. Okay, everything we talked to so far is what's called getting organic 
traffic from Google. And it is what everybody's after. <laughs> you don't have to pay for it. And it's just great. However, I'm sure that you've seen when you do a search on Google, the first two to four listings will say ad next to them. Those are people that paid to be there. Then you'll see the Google Maps listings. Those are free. And then below that, there'll be about four or five listings that don't say ad. Those are the organic ones. And then sometimes even below that, I've noticed recently, they're putting one or two more ads down on the bottom. So for every page, you've got maybe four real listings that, that they didn't pay to be there. So it's very, very hard to become one of those four, especially when you have, I've seen a lot of times people's Facebook page will rank higher than their website, which is yet another reason to do social media. And they didn't even do anything to Facebook. It's just there. Um, so that's organic. Say you want to be one of those paid listings. There's many, many places where you can pay to be there. It's called pay-per-click. Um, I, if the product is a good fit for Facebook, I typically recommend that because you have more control over the person that you target and the price is substantially less. So if somebody just keeps insisting on doing Google, I'm like, okay, let's try it. Let's put a couple hundred dollars in there. Let's set up a really good list and let's see what happens. You can set your budget by the day, by the week, or you can just say, I want to only spend this much period and see what it, what it does. It's a good idea to do both and see which one's going to get you a better bang on your buck. But most of these um, paper clicks only charge you if somebody clicks through to your site. So I noticed when I did Google AdWords, I had my ad shown like 200 times and only one person clicked it. I didn't pay for those 200 times. I only paid for the one click. But another bad thing too is that person, <laughs> I got several sales calls that week, people trying to sell me stuff, hosting services, all kinds of things. And I'm like, I just paid $23 for that person to call me with a sales call. So that's part of the bad part. Right. Absolutely. Um, okay, so let's, we talked a little bit about claiming your business. Um, so let's move on to Google Analytics. Okay, so in order to know what's going on with your website, you have some free tools that you can use. You, let's say you work really hard to get all these people to go to your website. How do you know they went to your website? How do you know where they came from? Well, the best product for that is Google Analytics. It's free. Um, you do, when you sign up, um, you will have to verify your site. Um, uh, they have a variety of ways that you can do it, but more than likely you will have to put a code on your website. It's a copy and paste thing. If you don't feel comfortable with it, you can get um, your web designer to do it. Um, if you're using WordPress, there's a plugin for that, of course. So Google Analytics is free and you will be able to gain insight into your visitor demographics. You'll be able to see basic information like where they're coming from, what type of device they're using, what pages they go to, how long they stay on each page. And the most important thing is called a bounce rate. So a bounce rate is like, see somebody goes to your page and they don't like it and they leave in five seconds. That's a very high bounce rate. That's another bad flag to Google that they will penalize you for because they're basically saying, oh, this site isn't interesting. People don't like it. I'm not going to put it at the top of the search results. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to understand all of this information. And it integrates with your Facebook advertising, your Google, everything, all kind of links together if you know what you're doing and know how to set it up. Absolutely. Um, and in addition to Google Analytics, I would also highly, highly, highly recommend putting a Facebook pixel onto yes. your website because that will allow you to track um, all the visitors on your site and Facebook will be able to match those up with people on Facebook and you can do some really cool stuff with that in chat etc. But the funny thing about that though, you remember I told you that that W3 consortium did a bunch of tests and one of the things they did not like was that pixel code. So I just had to think long and hard about it said I really want my pixel code more than I care about this site telling me that it's bad. Yeah. So there's something about that. It's a JavaScript. They don't like it. But you know what? That's one little one little thing, and we don't even know if that affects SEO anyway. So I'm keeping it because you're right. It's very important. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, the Google Search Console and Bing Webmaster Tools, and then let's wrap this bad boy okay. up. These are both basically the same thing. Google's way, way, way bigger than Bing. So uh, if you only do have time to do one, do Google. So basically what it is is like um, it's a webmaster tool. You sign up for it, you prove that you own the domain name, and you get access to all of these tools that you would want, like adding your site to Google, um, adding a no-follow script, uh, removing your site from Google, Google Analytics, I mean, all of these things. So I, it is all free. So definitely do that. Um, the links will be at the end of this uh, thing. And also, um, I am offering a free website analysis to anybody, like say, you don't want to do all this. Okay, fine. I'll do it for you. Um, just email me. Um, Ben's going to give you the link. Uh, there'll be a page that you go to, actually, and it'll say free website SEO analysis. And I will do some of these tools on it and give you a report so that you can know where you're, you are at. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, again, like Betsy was saying, all these things are very, very time consuming. Okay. You have more important things to do in your business, like focusing on generating revenue. Right. Mm -hmm. So I would highly recommend to leave the SEO, which is extremely important as far as gaining that traffic to convert to revenue. I would I would let a professional do it. So uh, I would definitely highly recommend to take Betsy up on this offer uh, of the the free website analysis. Um, Betsy's good, y'all. And, you know, she's, she's been proving it this whole webinar. Um, but I can personally vouch um as well, you know, Betsy, you definitely helped me out with a lot of different things in the past, and I'm very grateful for everything that you've done for me. Thanks, um, man. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So again, uh, there's going to be a link very readily accessible to you uh, to go grab that free analysis. Um, and also, what I think would be cool is all those links uh, that we talked about um, throughout this webinar. Um, let's actually put that on the landing page as well. So. When you go to the page to grab your free website analysis, um, there will also be all those links and everything, and, and uh, all of that will be readily accessible to you. Um, so just head on over to Betsy's website, and she will take care of you. So uh, again, Betsy, thank you so very much for coming on this webinar. Um, I really do appreciate your time. You dropped some serious value bombs on us today, uh, and I really do appreciate it. Um, so, if, you know, if you have maybe one last thing in closing and then, then we'll wrap this one up. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing left. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Awesome. So everybody, thank you so much for attending, um, this live webinar training and I hope this has been very helpful for you. I hope you have gotten a lot of value out of it. Again, go to the link that is going to be presented to you and go grab your not only free website analysis but go grab all of those very very helpful links to help you dominate seo so everybody uh i'm ben gother we've been talking to betsy irvine today thank you so much and take care all right bye, -bye.